Today is day 198 of reading the entire Bible this year. Today we read Isaiah 18 through 22, so let's get to it. Isaiah 18 is going to start off by talking about Cush. Cush is sometimes referred to in scripture as Ethiopia, but it's not quite where modern Ethiopia would be. It's more uh, referring at this time to this region, which would be the bottom part of Egypt and the northern part of Sudan. So still somewhat in that area, but um, not quite identifying the exact modern borders that we would understand as a lot of this stuff is borders are changing all the time and this was several thousand years ago so it's been a minute as we read through Cush and the prophecy against it a couple of things verse five and six he talks about before the harvest when the blossom is over and the flower becomes a ripening grape he cuts off the shoots with pruning hooks and the spreading branches he lops off and clears away they all they shall all of them be left to the birds of prey on the mountains and to the beasts of the earth and so this kind of flourishing spreading tree is actually going to be pruned way back or this spreading vine is going to be pruned way down by the lord and so this thing that stands feeling strong and righteous and at the beginning and at the end it talks of to a nation tall and smooth to a people feared near and far they're going to be pruned by the lord and when they are a people tall and smooth people feared near and far are going to carry a tribute to mount zion to the lord of hosts and so this people that is known for their strength and stature is going to be humbled before the Lord. Next, we have Egypt. Egypt has a lot of negative history going for it regarding Israel, right? Because they were the ones who enslaved the Israelites for 450 years. So the oracle concerning Egypt is going to point toward, you know, I'm going to make your idols shake. I'm going to take away everything that you think they do for you. And then when you turn to them and you turn to necromancers and you turn to sorcerers and you turn to your idols, not only are they not going to come through and restore you, but I'm going to put somebody worse over you, a harsh master, a fierce king. One of the things it talks about toward the later in the chapter is it says, uh, as it gets into verse 16, it starts talking about how there will be a small remnant or a small portion of Egypt that will turn to the Lord. And they will even start speaking the language of the land of Canaan, which is sort of a reference pointing back to the Israelites because that's where they are in the land of Canaan, right? And so where the Egyptians wanted nothing to do with the Israelites except to have them as slaves when they were there in their nation. Now they're going to be taking on these characteristics of Israel. They're going to speak their language. They're going to worship their God. They're going to set up their cities. And then in verse 18, it says one of these will be called the city of destruction. And in Hebrew, that word there, city of destruction, some translations and some manuscripts actually have a slight variation that says city of the sun, which would be Heliopolis or the, the city of the sun god Ra. And so by calling it the city of destruction, which is just one Hebrew character different, then it's sort of a play on words. And we're going to see a bunch more of those where now instead of worshiping the sun god, it's going to be a place that's destroyed and torn down to establish an altar of the Lord. So it talks about completely flipping this. And then it says there will be a highway between Egypt and Assyria. And uh, in between will be... Um, will be Judah and Israel and the three will be the people of God praising the Lord all over the world and declaring his light all over the world. In chapter 20, we're going to see a different kind of a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Isaiah is going to be called to walk around naked and barefoot for three years. Now, that might mean that over a period of three years, he keeps stepping out to prophesy naked and barefoot. And that might be what it's referencing here. It doesn't say he did it the whole time and for three years he wore no clothes. It's just sort of like in passing. And the next verse says, and after three years, now this. Either way, it's a prophecy displaying how Egypt and Cush are going to be carried off by Assyria as they're conquered and they will be stripped naked, even uh, their buttocks uncovered, like fully naked. And this sermon illustration that Isaiah gives lasts three years where he keeps somehow showing up or maybe he spends the whole time wandering around Egypt and Cush or just around Israel talking about how Egypt is going to be con conquered. We don't get that 
kind of detail of where it is and exactly how he goes about it. We just get that this is what happens over a period of three years. But the point of it is this very graphic, very striking illustration of what's going to happen to Egypt and Cush. And we see this even in the New Testament. You see uh, at one point a prophet comes up to Paul before he's arrested in Jerusalem, right? And he comes up and he takes Paul's belt off him and he ties himself up with it. And he goes, the man whose belt this is will be bound just like this and led away and blah, 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 and all of that. And so that's the kind of, you know, this kind of illustrative prophecy that does come true. And if it doesn't, and, you know, if it were to not, then you would look and be like, wow, what a kook. He's a, you know, false prophet. But instead, all this does come to pass. And so this thing, shortly after Isaiah preaches this for three years, it does come to pass and Egypt and Cush are taken away in droves up to Assyria. Chapter 21 gives us three different prophecies against other nations. Each one contains a little bit of a play on words, but wilderness of the sea is in reference to Babylon. We catch that toward the end of the prophecy where it says fallen, fallen is Babylon. And so we realize then that it's been talking about Babylon, but Babylon is deeply inland, not by the sea. And so there's a bit of a play on just the metaphor there of wilderness being a place of um, you know, barrenness and lack of productiveness. It's not a place you can farm. It's not a place where it's safe. It's not this big thriving city that has agriculture and everything. And, uh, you know, the sea often, especially in prophetic literature, represents chaos and overwhelming power against you. And so the, uh, the wilderness of the sea or the wilderness by the sea is Babylon being overrun, overwhelmed, completely chaotic and destroyed and taken to a place of barrenness and uh, all of its fertility and fruitfulness as an agriculture and as a thriving economy, all of that goes away. Um, then concerning Duma is a little bit in Hebrew, sounds a little bit like Edom, except Duma means silence. And so the land of silence instead of Edom, which, um, you know, is calling out to uh, hear like, hey, what's going on? What's with this night? When will it end? And like, oh, yeah, yeah. morning will come. But first also night. And so there's, you know, kind of this like response of this people that their voice is not heard because they're unrighteous and do not stand properly before the Lord, although they are still kind of encouraged to keep inquiring, come back. Seek the Lord, if you will, and seek and you will find, and there will be mourning. And then the same thing for Arabia, but concerning Arabia ends up sounding a little bit like in evening and so are at evening. And so again, talking about in the darkness, here is the people of Arabia being scattered by the sword and by running from enemies and the bent bow and all of that. And so you have all of these uh, nations that will be kind of seeing this destruction or conquering and scattering based on, uh, you know, kind of plays on word. And for a period, the years of a hired worker part at the end there is for a period of time, not forever, but all of this, the point of all of these things, all of these judgments is to point people back to the Lord that they might turn to him and repent and pursue him and find salvation in Yahweh. And that's the, the running theme in all of these things is that salvation is found in Yahweh alone. Whatever else you turn to, you will not find it except in Yahweh, which brings us to chapter 22. This one, the oracle concerning the Valley of Vision, which we find out in verses 9 and 10. Now we're talking about Jerusalem. Now we're talking about Judah and Israel. Now we are talking about with so much irony the valley of vision and then everything is about how they don't understand what's happening and they don't understand what's coming at them and they pursue all the wrong things and their visions of mirth and joy and recklessness and and debauchery and sin are leading to their destruction and they are not following the vision and re revelation of the lord and so that's where this carry this chapter carries us to this place of understanding that the Lord is no longer going to put up with this and stand for it. And then uh, the last paragraph here, starting around verse 15, he talks about casting out this evil steward, this worthless steward, Shebna. And so he says, I'll take you like a stone and 
put a firm grip on you and throw you into the wilderness. And that could be like, you know, either like kind of a shot put or discus kind of throw, like grabbing it and then spinning and throwing or like in a sling. And either way, it's a good firm grasp, some spinning and launching, just meaning like I'm going to take you from this high place to just cast out completely off into the wilderness. And on top of that, I'm going to bring in this other guy. When I bring him in, I'm going to call him and uh, Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, he's still not going to do that great a job. I'm going to hang all the weight of everything on him. And even that is going to fail and he's not going to be able to stand up under it. He's going to prove incompetent and incapable of standing uh, for the Lord. And yet this is what the Lord has spoken. And so in all of these things, there's always, even when there's all this destruction prophesied, there's always a call to turn back to the Lord. It's never too late to repent. While we stand in this life, while we draw breath, it's not too late to repent. It's not too late to turn back to the Lord. It's not too late to double down on following him if we're already doing that and, and be warned and encouraged to continue following and to be a voice of one calling people to repentance, calling people to know that there is pending uh, destruction and that they should turn from their ways and turn to Yahweh and Jesus, place their faith in Jesus for he is the one king and judge who has the power of forgiveness and has the power to judge. So that's what stood out to me. I'd love to hear how you read this and, and what questions and thoughts you have. So let's talk about that in the Bible app or on these videos. Thanks for watching with us. Stay faithful. Keep praying through the word as you read it and be rad for Jesus.